We have finally made it. After nearly two years, the final wave of the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass has finally been released. This has by far the most content out of any wave we've seen, meaning we're at least ending off with a bang quantity-wise. As for the tracks, Wave 6 brings over the Acorn Cup, which consists of Romovanti from Mario Kart Tour, DK Mountain from Mario Kart Double Dash, Daisy Circuit from Mario Kart Wii, and Piranha Plant Cove from Mario Kart Tour. On top of those four, there's also the Spiny Cup, consisting of Madrid Drive from Tour, Rosalina's Ice World from Seven, Bowser's Castle 3 from Super Mario Kart, and Rainbow Road from Wii. Welcome to another episode of Level by Level. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the eight tracks I just listed and analyzing them based on how fun they are, but more importantly, how good I think they are as retro tracks. While Nitro tracks pretty much just have the job of being fun and creative, retro tracks have the job of not only maintaining what made the original version of that track work, but also changing and adapting it to make the reintroduction of the track feel justified. So with that said, how do these eight tracks stack up to not only the rest of the tracks in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, but also the rest of the Booster Course Pass? Will these be on the same level? as those, or will these be an overall downgrade or upgrade? That's what we're here to solve today. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. At 200k, I'm going to be ranking every 2D Mario level, and let's jump right into the first track of the final wave, Rome Avanti. For one last time, we're starting off this video with a Mario Kart Tour City track. Now I know I've said this in pretty much every video on the DLC at this point, but I've been sort of getting tired of these. To me, a lot of them just feel the same since their settings are usually just far too similar. Since they're also based on real world locations, as much as we may wish London was fake, the developers can't really be creative with the layout since they have to stick with the actual location. But that's not to say it's impossible to have a good one. Athens Dash from the last wave was a lot of fun. So let's run through Rome Avanti here to see just how well it stacks up. First off, before we actually start the race, we have a few things we need to mention. Right away, we can see the classic Tour Red Arrows, which of course indicates that the track is going to change each lap. I also just like that this takes place at night. It's not the only Tour City track to do so, but it still makes the setting of the city a little bit more interesting visually. But actually kicking off the race here, we have a small straightaway with some very minor turns. This lets you get an item, but it's otherwise not that exciting. Luckily though, that only lasts for like three seconds, because we then jump right off that road into the track's main attraction, the Coliseum. I finally mentioned a famous building on one of these tracks. <laughs> On this first lap here, we're taken up the Coliseum with a big turn around its edge. I always like big turns like this in Mario Kart tracks since they easily allow you to get the purple spark. The fact that it's going upwards also adds a good amount to it as well. My favorite part of the turn though is definitely the end as you top it off with a ramp. If you're taking the turn as tight as you can, jumping off this ramp can actually be decently scary since you'll be quite close to the edge. I really like this inclusion a lot. After that, we leave the Coliseum with another jump out the top, but don't worry, we'll be coming back here later. This jump here is also pretty neat just because of it being pretty big. When you land from the jump, we're also introduced to the track's first real shortcut cut being a cut through this patch of grass. This is a bit special though since it has us going under an archway, which makes the cut both more interesting and difficult. After the cut, we then go around the statue of a man on a horse. Horses are pretty cool, so I like this set piece. After the statue, we jump off some stairs and go past two more turns, with the last one having another cut for a mushroom. That brings us into a straightaway. Now in previous tour tracks, these were probably my least favorite parts since they were just, well, wow. How exciting. I get this just because of the need for accuracy, but it still makes the tracks a bit more boring. Rome, though, actually puts effort into these straightaways to make them not that boring. First off, it's a split path, which is nice to see, but the main thing has to be the enemies. There are rocky wrenches in the floor, and if you roll over them at the right time, you could trick off of them for a speed boost. It's a small addition, sure, but that at least keeps me a bit more engaged here. That brings us to the end of lap one, but we've still got two more laps to go through. Instead of us going straight from the start, we instead take a turn to the right, which actually ends up putting us right back on the same part of the track we were just at a few moments ago. That means if you're in the lead, you're very likely to run into other racers here, which I always find super interesting. Not only are the items in the backboard deadly, but the carts by themselves just act as obstacles that slightly block your path. A few other tour tracks also do this, but I think this one may be the most effective since the overlap is a lot closer rather than being spread out, so you're more likely to actually run into people here. After getting past the overlap section, we then have to ride up a few flights of stairs. These work as ramps, which is good for extra speed, but the path here is also split. While the left path is faster, the right actually has coins on the stairs, which makes for a good decision on if you want speed now, or coins for some extra speed later. After the stairs, we then have a turn on a dirt road, and then we have to jump back onto the main road, which also happens to be another overlap. Again, I love this addition, plus it's cool to be landing on people from above this time around. But now it's time for lap 3, which has us going left at the start. This brings us into a glider ramp, which doesn't really have too much to it, but it's nice to have it to spruce up the track a little bit. After that, we're taken into the Coliseum once again, but this time we stick to the floor and have to avoid chain chomps. While they are pretty easy to avoid normally, the metal where they bite actually acts as a ramp, which means you get an extra speed boost if you trick 
back off of it. That's a great way to get the players close and make the Colosseum a bit more exciting. Once you leave though, you pretty much just end the same way as lap one, but this time there's now a glider ramp at the straightaway. I like the additions of the fuzzies in the sky, it's another small obstacle to make this a bit more interesting. But with that, we have finally reached the end, and if it wasn't obvious, I thought this track was really solid. It managed to avoid a lot of the pitfalls the other tracks fall into, and its setting, while still in a city, does change it up a decent amount with the Colosseum. I do still think I like Athens slightly more due to its more complex design, but I have no problem putting Rome Avanti in A tier. Really happy we were able to get another strong city track for this last wave. As for the music, well, it's just kind of okay. Probably on the lower end of the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe soundtrack, but definitely not a bad song. But now it's time for an absolute classic. DK Mountain is of course from Mario Kart Double Dash, but also made an appearance in Mario Kart Wii, making this its second remake. Tour doesn't count. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I don't really focus on the changes given to the retro tracks in Tour, so I'm considering any changes that weren't seen in Wii as new to 8 Deluxe. So what I'm saying is I don't want to hear any erm actuallys in the comments. Starting off the track, we actually see one of the changes pretty much right away, being the addition of these barrels. They're in the off-road, so they basically change nothing, but they're cool set pieces regardless. Moving past those barrels though, we have a massive turn to start us off, which brings us right into the track's iconic cannon. I have always loved both this cannon and the one seen on DK Summit. It's cool to blast off to the top of the mountain and then have to race back down it. Much like the DK Summit Cannon, this also now has a glider ramp as well. You don't really control yourself during these segments, so it's mostly visual, but I still think it's a logical addition to make. Speaking of the visuals, I love what they did with the volcano here. Instead of just looking like it was drawn on with Sharpie, the face this time is actually modeled into the volcano. Since the mouth and eyes act as holes now, that lets the orange light from the lava inside shine outward, which makes the volcano look really cool. I already liked this before the update, so now that the face is even more detailed, I can't help but love it. I'm really happy they decided to put actual effort into the visuals of the booster course pass when compared to the first wave, because this is fantastic. Oh right, we should be racing. Anyway, onto the mountain. The mountain itself is great to race down primarily due to its terrain. It can be somewhat difficult to navigate due to how bumpy it is. This first turn too makes it really easy for your cart to get off the ground when you aren't even trying. After that turn, we're then met with the track's three big ramps. This is another visual thing, but I like how they look like they're made of part of the mountain as opposed to the wooden ramp scene in Wii. They also blend into the mountain much better here, with some of the terrain actually going over them, specifically at the edges. Another addition to these ramps are the three barrels placed on the last one. The ramp is so wide that it'd be very hard to run into them by accident, but hey, they're still cool inclusions. The next part of the road is extremely bumpy, which I think adds a bit of extra challenge, and also brings us to our first half pipe of the wave. This was of course an addition from the Wii remake, and I'm glad it's still here, even if I don't ever plan on taking it. Just to add on some even more challenge, there are also some rolling rocks here, so make sure to avoid hitting those. That brings us off the rocky part of the mountain, as we now have to go into the dirt portion. This section has always been interesting just due to how the turns are designed. Not only are they pretty tight, but they're also angled downward, making this a pretty intense ending due to how easy it is to mess up. I do also like how you can ride on the wall a bit, it makes coming down here more fun. This section remains mostly unchanged from Wii, keeping the half pipe and not adding too much else. Except for these off-road barrels, <laughs> Before I leave this section, I want to mention the gap cut you can make here. But turning at this part in just the right way, you can basically skip one of the turns, saving a bit of time. Shortcuts like this are always super fun, so I'm really happy they kept this in. But to end off the track, we then have to go across the rickety bridge. While it did wave around a tiny bit in the original, it's been turned up a lot here, so now you can actually trick on it. So overall, I again like this track quite a lot. It didn't change too much from its last iteration, but I don't think it needed to. I'm gonna put this right above Roman A tier. Not quite an S tier for me, but I would certainly understand someone putting it there. I will say the music is probably a bit worse though. Can't really put my finger on it, but I just didn't love this song. Still overall a fantastic track, it makes perfect sense as the final Double Dash track of the DLC. Well, it wouldn't be a wave of the booster course pass without a circuit track. Waves 3 and 5, pfft, what are you talking about? Of the four circuit tracks we've gotten from the booster course pass, I'd say Daisy Circuit is the only one I'm okay with the inclusion. There are definitely several tracks I'd take before it, but if they had to add a circuit, sure, Daisy Circuit is one of the better ones. It does kind of suck that they have a circuit track in the last wave, but whatever, I guess. So starting us off, we get a simple road to give us some item boxes before we move on to an orange road. I like the color scheme of this portion a lot. Not only does it fit with Daisy, but it's also different from the generic city roads that have been super overused by the tour tracks at this point. One thing I like about this section as well is that this off-road is small enough that you can actually just hop over it, which feels super satisfying to do. That brings us to the track's main shortcuts, being this cut up some stairs. This is the portion of the track that received the most changes from the original on Wii. Now there's a Piranha Plant standee blocking the path, which means you can't take the cut without a mushroom. You needed one to cut through the off-road before, but since you could probably just hop over that, this addition does make sense to close it off from people in the lead. On top of the standee though, instead of this just being a normal jump, it's actually a glider ramp now. This fits the track super naturally. I mean, it genuinely feels like this is how it should have been from the start, so it's a great inclusion. If you stick to the road though, you of course get to drive by the Daisy and Luigi statues, which are really cute centerpieces for the track. 
is what I would say, but then not giving Daisy a mouth makes it look really creepy. Once you move past the statues though, you then enter into a tunnel for a few turns and then exit with a small ramp. This lets you get on the elevated left side of the course for the first time, but there's really no point to it, so it's kind of a worthless addition to the track. This next turn though is pretty interesting, as you essentially have three different options. You can either take a super tight turn, a slightly bigger turn for some coins and boost panels, or you can go on the elevated left side. I don't know why you would, but you can. After that turn, we enter into the last one of the track. This time though, the elevated portion actually has a good use, since going on it will let you take this last turn slightly tighter. Since this road is skinny, staying on it can be a challenge, but if you manage to do so, you'll be able to save a good chunk of time, which I think is a cool addition to spruce up the track. If you stay on here, you can actually start the next lap elevated as well, which doesn't really do too much for you, but it is kind of cool. This path also makes the lower level a bit skinnier as well, making it easier to hit other racers at the finish line. But with that, we finish off the track. Definitely the simplest one so far, but not too bad. I don't really have much more to say on it, so I'm gonna give it a low B tier. The music, though, is definitely a highlight. I was wanting this track back pretty much just for the song, since I really like it. More than anything, I was just really excited to hear how this remix would turn out. Okay, I'm messing around. It's still really good and easily the best song so far, but I honestly like the original a bit better. Maybe it's just because I'm more used to it, but I feel like the Mario Kart Wii one just had better energy. But now it's time to end off the Acorn Cup with the Tor original track, that being Piranha Plant Cove. First off, I'm really surprised this track didn't come out with Petey Piranha since he's kind of the face of it, but regardless, how good is this track? Well, right away, we actually get ourselves a glimpse of the classic Tor track Red Arrows. While they're staples for the cities, this is actually the first time they've appeared on one of the Tor originals, which is pretty interesting to see. Another thing you may or may not notice at the start is that, believe it or not, we're underwater. Making this a sort of gloomy underwater chorus is a theme we haven't really seen, so I'm already on board with the idea here. But enough on the idea, let's actually start the race. We start with the minor split path, each of which having a pillar racers can trick on. Following those, you can also trick on these geysers of air. That then brings everyone onto a big staircase that takes them out of the water. Being outside of it doesn't last too long though, as we then have to dive right back in, which actually highlights one of my favorite parts about this track. I love how this is an underwater track that plays so much with its elevation. The water goes quite deep here, but despite that, you still go to the surface quite often. That means there are several portions where you jump into the water and fall for quite a while. Not only is that thematically really cool, but it's also very interesting gameplay-wise. There are a few tracks that have underwater physics despite them not being underwater, most notably the F-Zero tracks. The reason I'm bringing that up is because if you hold back on your controller while on those courses, you'll descend significantly slower. Since we're actually underwater on this track, that of course carries over, and it leads to some quite interesting shenanigans. On this first drop here, you can basically cut this massive chunk of off-road by just holding back in the direction of the turn. This not only saves a lot of time, but can be done without an item, which makes it a very fun cut to start off the course. After that, we are then brought back out of the water to meet up with the only attacking Piranha Plant on the course. Yeah, despite it being named after them, this is the only one, and he only appears in this lap. Anyways, after that, we are then asked to take a glider ramp. On 150cc, this is really nothing special at all, but it gets a lot more interesting in 200cc. If you didn't know, tricking off a ramp while in a glider will let you keep using your glider as if you never landed. Well, it just so happens that this next platform ends on a trickable surface, so by using Using the speed of 200cc, you can actually reach this part, trick off of it, and then glide underwater. That by itself is already pretty cool, but it gets even better. If you remember the first drop down I mentioned before, we were able to cut out a large chunk of land by holding back. Well, this time there's a bit of a hill in our way, but using the glider, we can actually get over it. Okay, so there's actually an invisible wall here. Visible walls are some of my least favorite things in games, so I was pretty disappointed when that happened here. Luckily though, not all is lost, as you can still cut out a good chunk of the hill here. But man, I really wish we didn't have to think about an invisible wall. Well, after that, you just get a bit of a slightly curved straightaway to end off lap one. Lap two starts pretty much the same, but once you get to the top of the stairs, you take a left instead of jumping into the water. This has us riding through a bit more of the temple ruins with a few more ramps to trick on. I also like how after you turn from this water and resurface, you can either stay on the ground for a little bit or take a ramp at the right. The lower path is faster, but the right has coins, which as I've stated before, is a cool dynamic. After the paths recombine, we get another drop into some water, which has another turn that can be cut holding back. That brings us to a straightaway that has a few thwomps and boost panels. If you aren't able to go under the thwomps though, don't worry as these small pyramids at the side can actually be driven on. After that, lap 2 ends pretty quickly, bringing us into our final lap. This has us immediately turn left, which also makes us have a bit of an overlap with the thwomp road I just mentioned. After that, we just have a few pretty simple turns. There are some clans that you can risk going into 
you for some items, but otherwise it is pretty barren. There's a shortcut here as well, which is a ramp in the off-road. Definitely nothing special, but the inclusion is nice. After that, you have the option to trick off a bunch of air geysers or collect a few coins, another speed versus coin decision. That eventually brings you down into an even deeper part of the water, which puts us face to face with the new Nagi eel. It basically acts like the chain chomps did on Rome, biting anyone that comes in front of it. I like this unique obstacle a lot, though I do think there's some wasted potential here. Unlike the chomps on Rome that had the ramps, there's really no reason to go close to the Unagi at all. That makes him far too easy to avoid. I wish maybe there was a last second item box or something that you could pick up there to make it worth it. Or even better, what if you could actually go through his tunnel for a shortcut? That would be really hard, but super cool. After that though, the track does come to a close. Overall, I think it's a pretty solid course. Its aesthetic is phenomenal, and it probably uses water physics the best out of any track in the game, but there are just a few things about it that bug me. There are also a few portions of the track that don't have much on it and feel a bit boring. I don't think that stuff is enough to ruin it for me though, so I'm putting it at the top so far in A tier. Oh, and I think its song is also my favorite so far as well. It sounds really good. But with that, we finally come to the end of the Acorn Cup. For me, I'd say this was just solid all around. There's no extremely big hitters here, but all of the tracks are good to even great. Far from the best cup, but also far from the worst, so I'm fairly happy with it. But with that being said, I think it's time we take a look at Mario Critic Deluxe's final cup, the Spiny Cup. After all these years, we've made it to the final tour city track of the bunch. It's been a pretty rocky road, but can Madrid Drive end us off with a bang? No. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna go out and say it, I wasn't a fan of this. This feels exactly like my definition of a boring city track, as it falls into pretty much every pitfall I can think of. Let's take a brief look at the layout to figure out why. You spend the first 15 seconds of the track driving on a pretty generic road before jumping off some stairs into a plaza area. It's kinda cool how open it is, but at the same time, being empty also makes it kinda boring. Well, it's empty until you see the giant sleeping wiggler. That just feels really out of place. I don't know, maybe it's a reference to some giant caterpillar invasion in Madrid, but to me, it just feels like the most random thing they could have put here. At least it is something kind of memorable. After driving past them, you go back onto some more generic roads before entering into a building. This is a nice change of scenery, but doesn't really last long enough to be memorable, so moving past it, we then go into another building, which is showing off some paintings. I actually do like this area quite a bit. Not only is there a piranha plant bursting out of one as an obstacle, but the art here is all really cute. This is mostly just something to appreciate outside of the actual race, but looking at the paintings was fun. After that, we reach the end of lap one, and lap two begins with another large chunk of boring road. You do eventually drive past two thwomps, which is cool, but then you're back on the road again. That brings you back to the Wiggler Plaza, with it now being awake. That doesn't really change too much, though, so moving past it eventually brings us to a glider ramp. It is kind of cool to fly through these water geysers, but it just feels like a much lamer version of Singapore Speedway, honestly. When you land, you have to turn on a dirt road and then jump through some arches. Finally, that concludes lap two, and then we could jump into lap three. This has you drive on the boring road for like 25 seconds seconds this time around, with the only mildly interesting thing being two Goombas around halfway through. Luckily though, that does bring us into my favorite part of the track, that being the soccer stadium. This is actually a pretty unique setting where you have to try and hit as many boost panels as you can while avoiding the balls. I also really like that they're being kicked by Goombas in shoes here, being a reference to the Goomba shoe power-up in the mainline series. Sadly, this section ends within 7 seconds and the track is basically done. So yeah, Madrid Drive just has far too much empty road and not enough interesting elements to make up for it. I'm not sure what the general consensus is on this, but it's a low C tier for me. Not the worst city track, Tokyo Blur still gets that honor, but Madrid Drive is definitely getting there. The song too is also really weak, one of my least favorite songs in the game. Let's just hope our next course can pick us back up. Our next track is Rosalina's I- oh my- when I saw this in the Wave 6 trailer, I was genuinely appalled. Listen, I know it's a bit that I'm a Rosalina hater, but everyone disliked this track. It was one of the most boring tracks in Mario Kart 7, and the fact that it's brought back in the last wave is so annoying. But why is this track so loathe? Well, why don't we jump into the layout to find out? First off, this aesthetic sucks. I'm sure the Galaxy fans soy at their screen every time they see this because, Oh look, it's the Comet Observatory, but frozen! But that really is not played into the track at all. All. It feels like they made the most boring ice track ever and then decided to add in these galaxy references at the starting line to make it seem like it was interesting. In reality, for basically the entire rest of the track, the aesthetic is just ice. The other ice-based tracks in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe are significantly more interesting aesthetically, so already, Rosalina's ice world is looking pretty weak. As for the layout, you start out on some snow before riding on the slippery ice. That of course makes it more difficult to control yourself, which theoretically adds more challenge, but for me it just made this feel worse. I don't have a problem with slippery tracks usually, but something about the ice here just fell 
awful. Anyway, after a few turns over a cliff, we do actually get a new addition for the track being these half pipes. This is gonna basically be the one positive thing I say about this, but these are a great addition. Not only do they fit in naturally, but they're placed in a spot where I'd actually want to take them. Usually I just think half pipes are neat and ignore them, but taking them here does actually seem pretty helpful. Coming off of those half pipes, we reach what's supposed to be this track's main highlight. Jumping off of here will have us land onto some ice, which just has a few penguins to avoid. What's mildly interesting is that each lap this ice will melt a little bit more, eventually forcing you to go underwater. Neither of the two paths are that exciting though, so I honestly don't find the gimmick that interesting either. The only real thing I can say about it is that I find it funny that you can just phase through the ice. The two paths here eventually recombine into a cave. I guess this cave is mildly interesting because this has a split path, the left being an easy but slow path and the right being hard but fast. The thing is though, the right is only fast because of these boost panels, and for some reason, they just don't feel good at all. I can't tell if it's because of the ice or the fact that they're extra long, but it just doesn't feel like they're making you move much faster. The paths aren't split for too long though, as they eventually let you exit the cave. There's an optional off-road ramp here, which is kind of neat, but otherwise, that's the end of this track. Airship Fortress died for this. I just get absolutely no entertainment value from this course whatsoever. I don't hate it, I just feel nothing towards it. So yeah, I guess it can be in D tier. The song is pretty solid, I guess, but I would have liked a remix of Airship Fortress more. Yeah, okay, let's just move on from this course. No, not an SNES course, why? Wait. Someone, Someone cooked, cooked here. here. Replacing our Super Circuit track for this wave, we got SNES Bowser Castle 3, and I am pleased to say, it's fantastic. Obviously, the two main things that make SNES tracks so mediocre are their boring themes and completely flat layouts. This remake of Bowser's Castle 3, though, definitely improves on the original. For starters, beside the base game Bowser's Castle, this is the only other Bowser's Castle in the entirety of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Despite every game before this point having one, they decided to only remake one, and while this would be far from my first choice, it does make its theme stand out. Let me just say, this track looks phenomenal. I'd have no trouble believing this was a base game track, which is fairly rare among this DLC. But all the incredible aesthetic changes don't even compare to the layout. The track starts out with a flat and simple 90 degree turn to the left, which obviously keeps it in line with the original. That all changes at the end of this road though, because this ramp is replaced by an anti-gravity strip. The entire booster course pass has been very reserved with its use of anti-gravity, but this track uses it phenomenally. After jumping past some fireballs, the track begins to incline upward as we reach the infamous portion filled with a ton of jumps. There are so many different options you can take as each split path has more more split paths of their own. Sticking to the left is of course the fastest, but it's not going to be easy. Not only do you miss out on the double item boxes, but there's also a lava geyser in the way. This is a great obstacle, but what I really like about it is that you can still dodge it even while it's out, since there is a tiny bit of road that is still spared from the lava. If you're not a fan of risking it or just want double items, then you can take the right path. This too also splits though, with the left path here being a bit faster, but the right path giving more coins. So there are reasons to take each of the segment's paths, and that makes it super interesting. It was already a highlight in the original, but its Mario Kart 8 makeover is fantastic. After that, we get to hit a few more anti-gravity boosters before going back to normal. This gives us a small breather by having us only need to dodge a few thwomps. That brings us to our next major change in the course. The original just had three paths, which were pretty simply separated by a wall. But here? No, those walls are now paths in and of themselves. They are extremely difficult to get onto and stay on since they're very skinny ramps, but managing to do so feels so good. Not only are they fast, but they basically keep you safe from the rest of the pack. It took me several tries to get up there, and it acts as a fun little challenge for each lap. If you don't manage to get up there though, there's no worries since the bottom paths have plenty of boost panels and ramps as well. Eventually, everything recombines into this fun descent down a spiral staircase that leads us towards the ending. Driving past the bone plants, we then have one more final jump for the finish line. Even this last jump is made interesting as there are thwomps in front of us that can block our path, but if we time it just right, we can actually jump off of them to get another boost of speed, which could potentially end up swaying a race last second. But with all that being said, this was phenomenal. Not only did it manage to make an SNES course more interesting, but it did so in a way that felt like it was an original Mario Kart 8 retro track. The anti-gravity was such a good addition, and every aspect of this track was fun to race on. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this at first, but seeing as I have literally no negatives, I think this deserves to be a low S tier. The music here too is also great, one of my favorite remixes of this way. Like I said, literally everything about this track was made better. I think Bowser's Castle 3 is really cool. 
but now we've made it. The final track added to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. It's been a long ride with this game, and I can't think of any better track to end it on than a Rainbow Road. This comes from Mario Kart Wii and is easily one of the most popular renditions of the track, likely only behind 3DS Rainbow Road. This coming back just made far too much sense, and I'm incredibly happy it did. But was this remake able to do it justice? Let's find out. Starting off, I might end up being a bit controversial here, but I think it might be my least favorite looking Rainbow Road in this game. It and the original 8 are close, but something about this one just makes it look a little too mobile game-like. Still, it doesn't look bad at all, but it's probably my least favorite of a fantastic bunch. Even if it may not look the best, it definitely wins in a different aesthetic element. This has the unique mechanic of having your character burn up into a fireball upon falling off. They even get the camera detached from them before Lakitu picks them up. This is of course a reference to how it worked on the Wii, and I am so happy they decided to keep that in. I mean, I would never fall off, but it's cool for those that are into that sort of thing. But enough about the aesthetics, what about the track itself? Well, to start us off, we can see that our carts are in anti-gravity mode. That fits absolutely perfectly for this track, and on top of that, this is one of the few tracks to have underwater physics. This will come up more a bit later, but I wanted to make sure I got that out of the way. This track starts with its iconic dip down, giving us a chance to hit a bunch of boost panels for extra speed before jumping into the course. This puts us onto a turn with some more boost panels, which also removes the guards on the left side. That makes taking the half pipe here a huge risk. Personally, I'm a bit too scared to do it myself, but I think that's a cool inclusion. We're then met with a wavy road, a Rainbow Road classic at this point. This gives us a chance to get a ton of extra coins, but due to how much the elevation of the waves changes, the coins can be quite hard to nab. After leaping off the wavy road, we then land on the iconic road with the double holes. There are basically three main ways you can go about doing this. You can take the half pipes, go around the holes, or attempt to jump across them. Jumping the holes is definitely the fastest, but at the same time, also the hardest. But this is where the underwater physics really come into play, as they change how you have to go about this. Despite how large the jumps are, it is possible to cross them without a mushroom. If you jump and then hold back, you'll be able to fall slow enough to cross the gaps. Be careful though, because if you hold forward instead, you'll almost certainly fall. That makes these jumps not only really tense, but some of the most unique in the game since you have to go about it in a completely different way. Despite how difficult those are though, I think coming out of this may be the hardest part of the whole track. The road here is just so twisty that it's super easy to fall off, or at the very least to slam into this fence and lose all of your speed. They even added some anti-gravity boosters here, which in turn adds a bit more speed into the equation. What makes this part even more interesting though is how you can get onto it. In 200cc, taking this normally is almost not even an option, so you have to get a bit creative. Due to this track's physics, you can actually jump across this gap onto the turn, which is not only faster, but super exciting. It can be quite difficult to do properly, but getting a handle on it can make racing here feel even more satisfying. After that, we then get ourselves put into another cannon, which not only looks great, but also now has a glider ramp. Then we have one of the most interesting jumps on the entire track, as it's actually a half pipe. That makes this really fun to take, especially if you cut it as tightly as possible, since you can skip the long half pipe animation if you come at this at the right angle. Be warned though, it's very easy to fall off if you miss, which just adds another dimension to this track. Coming from there, we then have a split path, both of which having two boost panels and being around the same length. Jumping off of them brings us into the track's last major turn, which has quite a few boost panels that you can grab at the risk of falling into the void right at the end. But if you're successfully able to avoid becoming a fireball, the track finally comes to a close. This was a fantastic way to end off the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass. Not only do I think it's the hardest course they've added, but it's also just one of the best. While the layout stays mostly the same from Wii, the physics changes alone was able to make this an incredible remake. I look forward to racing on this track a ton more in the future. Easy S tier, the best track of this wave by far. And on top of that, they gave it the best song as well. Rainbow Road themes are always phenomenal, and this does not disappoint. So while the Spiny Cup may have had a rocky start, I think it's safe to say that the back half definitely made up for its shortcomings. Overall, I am very pleased with this final wave of tracks. While that may be the end of the courses, Wave 6 is actually far from being done. Hey, for no reason in particular, I want you all to listen to this clip from my Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass nitpicks video. It's a bit odd that the second to last wave will have more characters than the last wave itself. Yeah, they just decided to add four anyway. The new characters for this wave are some pretty heavy hitters. Diddy Kong is of course very popular, so him coming back makes a lot of sense. Funky Kong is the face of Mario Kart Wii and one of the most popular Mario Kart characters in general, so seeing him come back was fantastic as well. My personal favorite though was Pauline. What can I say? I have a huge Odyssey bias. Oh yeah, they also had a peach yet. So considering we were only expecting two more, I am very pleased with the characters we got here. It technically doesn't even end there though, because they also added 18 new Mii costumes. The Daisy costume you have to unlock with an amiibo, but the rest are completely free. Those are the question mark block suit, castle suit, Toadette suit, dry bowser suit, chain chomp suit, cheap cheap suit, dolphin suit, pokey suit, blooper suit, koopa clown car suit, harabitty bud suit, ice cream suit, birdo suit, pd piranha suit, 
Wiggler suit, Goomba suit, and the Moo Moo suit. But yeah, I'm really happy that those were thrown on too. They totally didn't need to do that, but it was great to see. One other small thing they added was a music menu, so now you can listen to any of the track's themes anytime you want. Yeah, there he is. The last change I want to mention before we end here has to do with balancing. They finally eliminated sandbagging as a strategy, since players will now get significantly worse items if they pick up items from the same set of boxes within a short time frame. I always thought sandbagging was a super lame strategy, so I am very happy to see it removed. But anyways, that's it for this video. Do you all think those two Goombas on Madrid Drive make the track absolutely peak and hate me for calling it mid? Let me know in the comments. And of course, I've been holding it back long enough. Here is my complete tier list for all of the courses in the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass. Now don't take this as a 100% confirmed list just yet, because I may be planning a ranking of the tracks in the future, but these are my opinions right now based on my first impressions of Wave 6. And also let me just say, it's crazy that it's finally over. This has been one of the best DLCs for any game on the Switch. I've loved keeping up with this, and I think they overall did a great job. I'm definitely looking forward to playing on these tracks a ton more in the future. But anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this little mini-series on the Booster Course Pass. Dry Bones for Smash, and I'll see you guys next time.